Hi, welcome back to Embracing Hope. Well, as we watch what's coming out of Hollywood and the television series, the movies and so on, we can see that there's, even among the secular group, there's an expectation of some world-changing events. They're going to turn the whole world upside down, the end of an era as we know it, or perhaps even the end of the world. And we hear so much speculation today as to what's coming, that, you know, it's going to be 2012 is when everything's going to happen and that type of thing. We hear even within Christianity, certain evangelical Christians saying that Jesus, his return is imminent, that the Lord is coming. But then we also hear within other elements within Catholicism of this is not the end of the world, but the end of an era, and that there's going to be a time of peace, an era of peace or a triumph. And so in this program, I want to speak about what I believe is coming based not on my own opinion again, but based on what the church tradition is saying on what the early church fathers and the voices and within the church are telling us and have been saying for over 2,000 years. And I think we're just beginning now to recover those things because for a long time, it seems that the whole notion, the whole talk of the end times or the coming of Christ has been buried in the church, which was certainly not the spirit of St. Paul or St. Peter or St. John. There was always this expectation of the perusia, the coming of our Lord, of those end times, of that last period. But for some reason, reason in modern times, we have priests and bishops and, of course, lay people who are, oh, no, 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 we don't want to talk about this stuff. And, you know, even banning people who speak about these things from coming to their diocese. It's a strange time that we live in when we start to bury great portions of the sacred scriptures because we just don't want to talk about, we don't talk about those kinds of things. It's doom and gloom, you know. Doom and gloom, it's the return of Jesus. That's our hope. Jesus said, when you see these things happening, lift high your heads. Because we see that the, the end of, of all things is eventually coming, that we're drawing nearer and nearer. But there are things that have to happen, brothers and sisters, before the return of Jesus Christ. That's our tradition. That's what I'm going to speak about in this show, is that we are approaching not the end of the world, and I don't even believe the imminent return of Jesus, but we are approaching the end of an era that then is the royal road, you could say, the steps that are leading toward the great heavenly banquet, towards that final coming of Jesus Christ in glory, that we are, we are in an end time period. This according to the thinking of the church fathers, and of course you've heard me talk about what the popes have been saying. And, you know, I just did a conference in Toronto and I spoke to the people, you know, and I talked a lot from my book, The Final Confrontation, and I quoted, you know, from the popes and the early church fathers and, and just laid out the picture from them without giving them really my opinion, but what, what the church fathers are saying, and I remember that one of the organizers of the conference came up and he said, you know what, what you're doing is you're just giving what the church is saying and, and really says it's hard to refute it. Yeah, it is hard to refute the church because that's the mind of Christ. We are approaching the end of an era, brothers and sisters, and sooner than many people in the church are prepared for or that many people think. And St. Paul tells us about something that must happen before the ultimate return of Jesus. He said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day, that is the day of the Lord, will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and render powerless by the manifestation of his coming. So I want to look at this passage because St. Paul is warning the Thessalonians and us, of course, hey, look, the return of Jesus isn't going to come until a few things happen. One is that there's going to be a great rebellion, a great apostasy. And you've heard me in previous webcasts and in my writings quote several popes who have said that there is an apostasy in the church, that this is the great plague of our times, that plague of infidelity. And also, he says that there must be the appearance of the lawless one, the son of perdition, whom tradition identifies as the Antichrist. Cardinal Ratzinger said uh, many moons ago that uh, the Antichrist isn't just one individual, that he, he takes on many masks, many persons throughout time, but that there will come one individual whom tradition, you could say, is the capital A, Antichrist, that son of perdition, that he too must come. And then we read in this passage that the, the Jesus Christ, by the breath of his mouth, will render powerless by the manifestation of his coming, this Antichrist, this lawless one. He'll be put to death. Now, the question is, is that the final coming of Jesus in glory? 
We know that Jesus comes at many times. He's come many times since his uh, ascension into heaven. He's appeared to people throughout the world. We know many of the saints, such as Faustina, have recounted how Jesus has appeared to them. We hear incredible stories lately of Muslims whom Jesus has appeared to and, and basically brought about instantaneously their conversion as they've recognized him as their Messiah. We hear beautiful stories of Jesus even appearing in jungles to tribes people who aren't Catholic, who aren't Protestant evangelical, but they die for their faith, they die for Jesus being truly Christians for the Lord. So we know Jesus comes and of course the great coming of Christ is also in the Holy Eucharist. Jesus every day, 22,000 times or so, every day throughout the world is made present on the altars of our churches. Jesus is constantly coming because he said to us, I will be with you until the end of time. So Christ comes to us. He truly remains with us until the end of time in so many beautiful ways, in so many beautiful manifestations. Now, what Jesus is saying here, according to the thinking of the church, of the mind of the church, and what they were taught by Jesus from the earliest times, is that this manifestation is not the final return of Jesus in glory. In fact, you know, you might have heard of this book. It's kind of a popular book right now because uh, uh, St. Therese apparently said reading this book was one of the greatest graces of my life. It's called The End of the Present World, written by Father Charles Armagnon, if I'm pronouncing that right with my French. And in this book, uh, my spiritual director asked me to read it, and so I did. I picked it up, and I was delighted what I read because it really confirms everything that I have been saying on this show that the, the tradition of the church is that we're not approaching the end of the world, but we're approaching the final confrontation of a 2,000 year confrontation between the woman and the dragon, between Satan and the church, between our Blessed Mother also and the serpent. And so when we look at Jesus coming in this manifestation, the breath of his mouth killing this Antichrist, the interpretation that that's the return of Jesus in glory, Father Charles says this interpretation is incorrect. St. Thomas and St. John Chrysostom explain the words in the sense that Christ will strike the Antichrist by dazzling him with a brightness that will be like an omen and a sign of his second coming. St. Paul does not at all say that Christ will kill him with his own hands, but by his breath. That is, as St. Thomas explains, by virtue of his power. And so, not the second coming of Christ, but a manifestation of his power. We hear this symbolism in the book of Revelation as well as Isaiah, where it says, from his mouth issues a sharp sword with which to smite the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. The beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in its presence deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone, and the rest were slain by the swords of him who sits on the horse." Highly symbolic language, but again, the church father is telling us this isn't Jesus returning and doing it himself, but it's a manifestation of his power, whether it's St. Michael the Archangel, the Holy Spirit, whether it's some other angelic force we don't really know, but what we do know is that it's not the return of Christ. In fact, Revelation goes on to say that then there's the first resurrection, the resurrection of the martyrs, those who did not take the mark of the beast, and they reign with Christ while Satan is chained in the abyss for a thousand years. Scripture doesn't say, Revelation doesn't say anything about, you know, this is it. Suddenly that's the final judgment and that's, no, it talks about, again, Satan being chained, and then after a symbolic period of a thousand years, he's released. And, and, and he deceives the nations who go after the church who's gathered in Jerusalem. So listen, brothers and sisters, certainly there's more to happen afterward. As it says in Isaiah, He shall strike the ruthless with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Justice shall be the band around his waist, and faithfulness a belt upon his hips. Then the wolf shall be a guest of the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The prophet Isaiah telling us that there'll be a manifestation of Jesus who will purify the earth of all wickedness and then there will be an era of peace in which the lion will lay down with the lamb. That's where we're headed. That's exactly what our Blessed Mother said at Fatima, that a period of peace is coming for the world. And that's, of course, what our church fathers have talked about as well.
Now, a footnote in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible explains that the destruction of the Antichrist and the chaining of Satan is not the end of the world. It says, the destruction of the dragon must coincide in time with that of the beast, so that the first resurrection with the reign of the martyrs refers to the revival and expansion of the church after years of persecution. And so, brothers and sisters, this is why God has been sending us His Blessed Mother now in an intense way for decades and, and of course, centuries. He is preparing the church and the world right now for a great purification. The entire world is going to change radically. It's going to be completely different. And that's why God is sending His Mother the Ark of the New Covenant, just as He sent, uh, had Noah build an ark in His time for the purification of the world at that time, so too He has sent our Blessed Mother, who she said her heart is a refuge for us. Her Immaculate Heart is a refuge. And of course, she takes us where? Not to herself, she doesn't cling to us herself, but she takes us to the safe harbor, which is the sacred heart of Jesus. And so we need to be prepared because these times, the labor pains that we are already beginning to see are the first signs of a great purification in which the wicked will be purified from the earth. And what some mystics like Blessed Anna Mary Tegi say will culminate in three days of darkness on the world. I just throw that in there because many people have asked me, you know, what about the three days of darkness and so on? Anyway, you can go to my writings. I've linked that writing underneath this, this webcast. If you're watching this show on EmbracingHope.tv, make sure you do look at the writings underneath the video and you'll see under related reading many links that I put that will relate to this show and give you more details and more information. Well, let's just talk for a moment about the early church fathers because this is essential. We cannot speak about the end times in our own personal way. As St. Peter warned, he said, many take the scriptures, these prophecies, and they twist and interpret them and give them their own personal interpretation. He says you cannot do that because scripture, it does not belong to the individual. It belongs to the church. It's not up to each of us to interpret. So again, I'm looking at what the church fathers say who are part of that sacred tradition of our church, that oral and written tradition as scripture says. Well, let's start then with the letter of Barnabas, which has been accepted as, a, as part of our tradition because it reflects the voice of many of the church fathers. It was written by a second century apostolic father who said, and he rested on the seventh day. This means when his son will come and destroy the time of the lawless one and judge the godless and change the sun and the moon and the stars, then he shall indeed rest on the seventh day. And you've heard me quote this before about the church teaching, the early church fathers speaking about just as God rested on the seventh day after the sixth day of creation, so to the people of God have a Sabbath rest coming within the boundary of time, that day of rest, that seventh day. Another church father, Saint Arrhenius of Lyon said, but when the Antichrist shall have devastated all things in this world, he will reign for three years and six months and sit in the temple at Jerusalem. And then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds, sending this man and those who follow him into the lake of fire, but bringing in for the righteous the times of the kingdom, that is, the rest, the hallowed seventh day. These are to take place in the times of the kingdom, that is, upon the seventh day, the true Sabbath of the righteous. And so within the times of the kingdom, within the boundaries of time, and I quoted, I think, last program, Tertullian, who said that before the final eternal kingdom, there will, there will be another kingdom only in another state of existence. You heard the letter to Barnabas speaking about changes in the sun and the moon and the stars. And I can't help but wonder at this moment if that miracle at Fatima, in which the sun seemed to draw closer to the earth, isn't part of a harbing or a sign that there's going to be cosmic changes in the world. I mean, of course, the, all this sounds fantastic, but I mean, I, I guess when you're talking about God who created the heavens and the earth and who comes to us every day on the altars of our church, nothing is impossible. Finally, Father Charles Amignon, speaking about the tradition and summarizing it in his own words, said, the most authoritative view and the one that appears to be most in harmony with Holy Scripture is that after the fall of the Antichrist, the Catholic Church will once again enter upon a period of prosperity and triumph. And so let me quickly summarize. 
we will see at the end of this era the arrival of one whom tradition calls the Antichrist, whom Christ, by the manifestation of his power, will slay. The beast and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire, but then the times of the church, the times of the kingdom, will be ushered in. The triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the triumph of the church. This is why this show is called Embracing Hope, because that's the hope that is coming. Now, when is it coming? Brothers and sisters, I don't know. Will this happen in my lifetime? Will it happen in yours? I don't know. But it's very interesting to hear what Father Charles Amignol wrote in his book, which was written in the mid-19th century, when he said, If it may be granted that after the Antichrist, the end of the world will not come for some centuries still, the same cannot be said of the supreme crisis that shall bring about the great unity. For if we study but a moment the signs of the present time, the menacing symptoms of our political situation and revolutions, as well as the progress of civilization and the increasing advance of evil corresponding to the progress of civilization and the discoveries in the material order, we cannot fail to foresee the proximity of the coming of the man of sin and of the days of desolation foretold by Christ. I wonder what would Father Charles say if he were alive today? as we look at the labor pains that are happening not only in nature but in society, as we see the rapid changes in technology, as we see a continuing growing lawlessness on Wall Street, in our governments and in our society, an abandonment of the commandments of God and a wholesale apostasy in many portions of the church, what would he say today? I think it's pretty obvious, brothers and sisters, that as he said, it's hard not to see that the coming of this lawless one is right on the horizon. What does that mean? My lifetime or yours? I don't know. And really, I don't really care in the sense that I'm preparing my heart that Jesus may call me home tonight. My preparation doesn't change. To go to confession regularly, to receive the Blessed Sacrament, to read the Bible and to pray every day, to pray that Holy Rosary, to join hands with my Blessed Mother. These are the things that we're called to do always. And if you're not doing them, then let this webcast, let this warning that is being issued through this webcast be a wake-up call for you to call you back to the heart of God and, and, and that's fantastic it's wonderful because there in the heart of God you're going to discover the meaning of life the purpose of your existence and that happiness which for which every soul which every one of us longs for that life in God that relationship in God and so brothers and sisters if you're not with the Lord today, it's time to return to Him because there is a delusion, a deception that will accompany this Antichrist that for all we know could already be here. As it says in 2 Thessalonians, that the coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be with all power and with pretended signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are to perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God is sending them a deceiving power so that they may believe the lie that all who have not believed the truth but have approved wrongdoing may be condemned. And that's why God has sent us St. Faustina and her message of divine mercy that you can know and I can know that there is not one sinner on earth whom God will reject who turns to him now. And so have absolute faith and trust in him who died on the cross for you and return to the Lord. And if you're a Christian, if you're a Catholic and you're with the Lord, but you're lukewarm right now, you're not serious about your faith, you're not spending time in prayer, it's time. It's time to get serious about the Lord, to begin to fill the lamp of your heart so that you're not caught unawares. Without the oil of faith in your heart, when He, that manifestation of our Lord comes, because as it says in Scripture, not only will the lawless one and that uh, the beast and the false prophet, not only will they be cast into the lake of fire, but all those who have refused to believe the truth and who have approved of wrongdoing. Let's return to the Lord and let's continue, brothers and sisters, to watch and pray. God bless you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. 